Balotelli. Aguero! Hello and welcome back to episode 129, I reckon it is, of the show. Apologies for the lack of content really in the last few days just got really snowed under with uni and had a few technical difficulties on the last podcast episode so there hasn't been too much action but I'm definitely looking to pick it up as uni starts to relax now Uh, and we're back again here to chat about the NRL and we will be doing our usual chatting about the round nine games looking ahead at the round 10 games also going to do a little bit of talk about the upcoming state of origin series we're going to name our New South Wales side this week. We're going to do our Queensland side next week. Um, And then, yeah, just really looking forward to getting into it. So we'll start with last week's round. Started off really poorly. Uh, A few absolute floggings. Thought it was going to be a really long one, and then it got really, really good on the weekend. Had basically five good games uh, in terms of scoreline closeness. So a lot of drama as well. So we're just going to, rather than doing a winners and losers, we're just going to go from game one to game eight and just touch on each of them as I go. Uh, so starting off with the Rabbitohs versus the Storm, obviously the Storm came out and demolished the Rabbitohs 50-0. Josh Adokar scored six tries, first person to do that since 1952, I believe, was the stat. Incredible performance from Adokar himself, incredible performance by the team. Sadly, they didn't come out of it unscathed. Cameron Munster, Harry Grant, and Brandon Smith all will be missing weeks. Brandon Smith for his suspension, the other two for injuries, which really doesn't help them, but they're that good. Every time someone comes out of reserve grade, they basically never look to miss a miss a beat. But for this, basically, we know the Storm and the Panthers are the best two teams in the comp, but I think this showed how far the gap is between them and the rest of the competition. Um, I think we thought there was a bit of a top five and then the rest, but it seems as though it's those two. Then maybe there's a three little echelon there and then the rest. Um, Because, yeah, they just looked way too good for the Rabbitohs, who, uh, yes, they were undermanned, but they are a team that is highly talked about as a premiership contender, and I think they got their pants pulled down a little bit. So I expect to see them have a huge bounce back. But, yeah, really poor... If you're, I know there's that stat about like no premiership winner has ever conceded 50 points. I don't really believe in that kind of stuff, but it basically does show to us, show us that if the Rabbitohs don't change something defensively, they're never going to win a premiership. Um, the, playing this way, yes, they do usually score a lot of points, but they're not going to be able to defend that way against the Storm and Panthers and outscore them. Because yes, their attack's good, but the Storm and Panthers' defenses are that good. They're not going to be able to put up 40, 50 points like they did against the Titans and get away with it. So, yeah, that's something they've really got to tighten up. Too many leaky tries. Uh, Yeah, it's just not good enough at the moment from the Rabbitohs. But, yeah, the Storm roll on, and for them it's just about maintaining this form right the way through the competition. Uh, Obviously, it'll be interesting to see how they go through the origin period. A lot of their key players will be there. Pappenhausen, Grant, Munster, so... Uh, just to name a few, so they're going to obviously have their issues filling those holes for a couple of weeks here or there, but um, and hopefully they pick up no injuries during those games for the Storm's sake, but the Panthers are in the exact same position, so yeah, at the moment it looks like it's a two-horse race, but we'll talk about that down the line. But yeah, the ba- big worries are from the Rabbitohs, they've got to really bounce back this week and show us that they're um, right up there with those two teams, otherwise, yeah, they've they're cooked, really. Uh, Panthers Sharks on the Friday 6 a.m. Dead shift. Didn't watch too much of this game, but the Panthers were just out too good for the Sharks. Uh, not really surprised. Think I had this as my sure bet of the week, and 48 nil suggests that's fair. For me, Panthers were just having some fun, really pl- throwing the footy around. Way too good for the Sharks. The Sharks, the wheels have just completely come off, and uh, the way some of the other bottom teams have hit form such as the Cowboys, Manly, the Broncos, uh, they look like a real danger to be a bottom two, bottom three side and that's a team that's made back-to-back final series so that's uh, putting a bit of egg on the face of the Sharks directors who got rid of John Morris even though he was willing to stay. Um, not saying that the Fitzgibbon thing was necessarily a bad decision but to get rid of Morris for this year uh, definitely looks like it was a poor choice. Uh, so I'm glad. I think the Sharks deserve to do really bad this year. I think the way they handled that John Morris situation was completely rubbish. So I hope they keep losing. 
feel bad for the players who are having a red hot crack each week and there's a few guys in free agency like Sean Johnson who their futures may be affected by a poor year but uh, yeah Sharks cop it uh, alright Eels versus the Roosters now this game I don't think I've been this fired up in a game since the Panthers versus the Tigers last year where Ivan Cleary did the famous uh, look at the scoreboard to the fans blew a few kisses as well um, and just thinking about it, oh yeah no there were fans at last year's games weren't there it was just a few, like a six week period I think where there wasn't um, but yeah anyway uh, so yeah what happened basically I think about a minute before half time Roosters went on a sweeping play. Teddy got the ball out the back, passed it off near Corey, came in with a shoulder charge and also a head-high hit. I think he only got charged with high contact, even though it was a shoulder charge. Uh, so he copped two weeks. Probably agree with that. Maybe he should have got more. Teddy was falling, so I do get that. And then that led to Drew Hutchinson having a chance at a try. They actually scored, didn't they? trying to remember yeah I'm pretty sure they did score um, and he put the ball down and Dylan Brown came in disgustingly with his knees no hands in in the way basically leaned back knees first wasn't even directed at the ball just purely directed at his ribs uh, and that was pretty dirty act and the fact that he got three weeks I'm not very happy with it uh, yes we don't want to take the result of the injury into account because that means Basically, if Hutchison got up and stood up, that Dylan Brown deserves to go free. But uh, three weeks, look, if he got punished heavily in the game and then cop three weeks, I think I'd be I'd be okay with that. But the fact that he got no penalty, no simbin, no send-off in the game, the Roosters basically got zero um, compensation mid-game for it, similar to the Tigers with Latrell Mitchell a few weeks ago. Um, sorry to bring it back to the Tigers, but it's a, it's a fair comparison. Uh, yeah, that's really disappointing because the Roosters had a player taken to hospital. Uh, so that's a player down. They weren't allowed to bring a sub on, which I think sometimes there's just no common sense in rugby league. Like a player goes to hospital, yet they're not allowed to bring on a sub because they're worried about they may be um, farming the rule. But yeah, I don't know. It's a tough topic. But yeah, that's pretty shite for the Roosters that they had the copper man down through a f- sheer act of foul play and just because he wasn't, I forget what it was because it was because he wasn't put on report instantly or something that they couldn't sub on the sub, something like that, um, which is just crazy. Um, and like Trent Robinson said, like Madge said the other week, when we've got this technology, um, everyone in Australia saw after one replay that that was a really bad piece of foul play, yet the refs aren't willing to apply some common sense, watch the replay, and then change their decision. Uh, It's just a bit stupid. Um, So, yeah, I think the fact that... I think he should have been... I genuinely think he should have been sent off and then cop three weeks. I think that would have been fair. Because I'd say a simbin, but the fact is people get simbin for, like, a professional foul where they might, you know, stop a quick tap. It's like that's not on on a similar level to kneeing someone in the ribs where they're in a, um, they can't defend themselves. So I think he should have been sent off and that he should have copped, um, that he should have copped three weeks. And you may think, yeah, it's just knees into the back. It happens all the time. But the thing you got to think about, that has nothing to do with rugby league, what he did. He wasn't trying to stop the ball. His hands were out of the play. He was purely just sliding into him. He could have jumped over him. He didn't even have to slide. Uh, yeah, just had nothing to do with rugby league. So similar to the trail thing last week, that's why I think he should be punished more heavily than, say, a high shot. Uh, so, yeah, that was really disappointing. However, he did get at least three weeks, which is good to see. Uh, but, yeah, the Eels went on to win the game, and quite frankly, I didn't... I wasn't impressed with the Eels. I don't think... I don't actually think either the team played that well. The Roosters, you can allow it because they had a couple injuries, but uh, the Eels were fully fit, and they were just going... Side to side, couldn't really break the Roosters' defence till late. And yeah, that was a little bit disappointing from the Eels. And look, I hate to shit down the Eels fans' throats, but it looks like they're just going to be the same as the last couple of years. They're going to be a good team, they're going to be top four, but then they're going to have no impact on the final series. I just don't see where their next gear comes from at the moment. Moving into the Raiders' Knights, the early Saturday game. Uh, Knights had a big comeback, I think it was in Wagga. 
Uh, so disappointing from the Raiders. I thought this was a good chance to bounce back for them after a few disappointing weeks. And the disappointments continued with the Knights really out of form. They let a big lead slip. And good win for the Knights. Puts them sort of back on track this year. Back in the hunt for eighth position or in the, for the eight. Um, and yeah, the Raiders are really on the back foot now. I know they were similar to this last year. I've talked about it non-stop week after week. But they've there's got to be a time where they start to turn it around or at least show signs of it. And they haven't really so far. And I'm getting worried for them because they are starting to reach origin. And they do have quite a few origin players. They've got a few injuries now. So um, this week's a big week for them. I think they play... They might play the Bulldogs or something like that. So that's a game they have to win. And they have to probably show us why they're a top eight team. Uh, So I'm expecting big things from them. Uh, Tigers-Titans, very high scoring affair as you would guess. Both teams can't defend... Tigers came within eight points. They only scored one less try than the Titans. Some great goalkeeping on display from both teams. And look, it was disappointing from a Tigers fan, but at the end of the day, you got within eight points of a top eight contender. I think the Titans really need to address their defence. I don't think they're going to have any impact on finals, um, let alone be there if their defence continues to be this leaky. I think they've let in 30-plus points for... Well, 28 Tigers, you know, that's 40 for most teams, given the quality of the Tigers. But they've let in a lot of points for about five weeks straight now, and that's really got to change because, uh, yes, they're a great attacking outfit, but they're never going to be able to put up against put up 30-plus points against a team like Melbourne or Penrith. I know not many teams can, but that's something they've got to sort out. Even teams of the elk of the ilk of the Eels and the Roosters, who they could easily come up against in finals... Uh, the Tigers were, were pretty disappointing. As usual, good in attack. Um, seized their moments in attack. I don't think they played very well, though. I don't think either team actually played very well. Um, there were no standout performers, really. AJ Brimson got the three votes. Didn't necessarily agree with that. I think Adam Dewey was the best on the park. Not saying he should have got three votes, because I know it wasn't a loss. But, um, yeah, apart from Adam Dewey, there weren't too many great players on the day. But, but it was high scoring, so I'm sure it was inter- entertaining for the neutrals. Uh, but yeah, Tigers got a big game this week against the Knights. Really got to bounce back. We'll talk about their team changes in a little bit. But yeah, disappointing. It looked like a game that both teams, well, the, the Tigers could have won or the Titans could have made a statement, and neither of those things really happened. So uh, not a part, probably a just a pass mark for both teams, I'd say. Uh, moving on to Cowboys Broncos, this was a really, really good game of footy. Both defenses looked really solid. Both attacks looked really structured and well drilled, and they looked like it was a good weekend for Queensland Rugby League. I guess the Titans back in the winners' column, and these two teams look like they're not going to be anywhere near the wooden spoon this year. So uh, I don't think, don't know if they're going to make the eight, but they look like they're going to be competitive in more games than not, which is always exciting for the fans. Uh, the Cowboys were just too good in the end, but I thought the Broncos, uh, not saying you know they're a top four contender like they were considered in the first two rounds of last year, but they legit looked like that team of the first two rounds last year. And the Cowboys looked really exciting. There was a lot of good sweeping plays from both teams, looked really sharp with the ball, um, not too many line breaks and stuff like that, a very solid defense, low scoring game, which is pretty rare at the moment in the NRL but it's good to see every now and then it came down to a field goal actually I can't lie it slipped my mind who kicked the field goal uh I I think it was Scotty Drinkwater actually but um yeah very good win by the Cowboys they keep winning Uh, I think they might sit in the top eight now and the Broncos they're another honorable loss which is frustrating but it's better than losing not honorably basically and I think the wins will start to come for the Broncos uh, so yeah, big weekends for those two teams with Magic Round. I know it's not a Cowboys um, home stadium, but there's Queensland fans there, so they both should have the crowd behind them. Uh, but next up on the Sunday Mother's Day games, we had the Seagulls versus the Warriors. Jesus, Tommy Turbo, how good is he? Um, three weeks ago, it was a question of whether Pappenhausen and Tedesco were the best players in the game, and right now people are saying that after only three or four weeks, that Turbo's borderline kicking Teddy out of his fullback spot for New South Wales, which can't say I would have thought anyone would have said that before uh, the season. 
yeah, incredible performance. And I have to say to the Warriors, I think they played really well. I think they beat most teams if they play like that. They just came up against Turbo, who was just on flames. I think he had something like five line break assists and four line breaks, something ridiculous like that. He just demands the footy whenever he sees a chance. And it really helps the other players because they obviously have pressure taken off them because they know Turbo is going to do something special every now. That's what the defence is thinking anyway. So those players are allowed a little bit more freedom. So Manly look like a really dangerous side now. I wouldn't want to play them even if I was Storm or Penrith. But especially those teams like the Eels, the Rabbitohs, um, they look like they're going to get a few big scalps this year and they're looking very likely to be there at the end of the season. Uh, but the Warriors... Yes, disappointing loss considering how many points they leaked in, but look, Harris DeVita had a successful comeback from injury. Uh, Walsh came off the bench, didn't have much impact, but uh, yeah, it's looking exciting for the Warriors. They're playing a really good brand of footy, and they put up 32 points, which in the past has been a Warriors weakness scoring point. So um, yeah, if they continue the way they're playing, they're also going to be there or thereabouts for the top eight. And then finally, didn't catch all of this game, saw a little bit of a little bit of it at a pub for Mother's Day. Uh, Dragons, Bulldogs, very low scoring affair till the floodgates opened at the end. I think it was like 4 0 at halftime to the Dragons. A uh, couple injuries to the Bulldogs, and then, yeah, the Dragons just really ran away with it. The big storyline coming out of this was that Flanagan got hooked about halfway through the second half, I think it was. I think he might have come back on for Lachlan Lewis, who was concussed potentially. But, yeah, disappointing from. Well, not disappointing probably exactly what we expected dragons yes they back in the winners column didn't necessarily put themselves back in you know everyone's good books in terms of thoughts on their top eight hopes i think they still sit in sixth on the ladder but they're not looking like the team they were at the start of the season that's for sure so they're going to be an interesting one to track especially through um origin actually they don't really have many origin players now do they because hunt doesn't play origin frizzell's left maybe paul vaughan but that's about it uh so yeah that that could actually work in their favor they could steal a few games over the origin period yep so that's my recap of the weekend's uh action let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with my thoughts and what you made of the round um now looking at the team list just some big Rarely I do this after the team lists have come out, and I am this week, so I thought I'd touch on some of the changes. Uh, the biggest talking point, maybe not for other people, but definitely in my family as Tigers fans, was the Tigers' structural change. Now, this I'll be honest, I think Michael Maguire has to come out and explain his thinking here. Unless he just has picked this team and they're just going to swap Dewey and M by before kickoff. But some drastic changes, which we've been calling for for a while... Uh, but not necessarily the changes we maybe have had forecasted. Do we move to centre? Which, in my opinion, is absolutely outrageous. I think he's been one of the form 5.8s. Um, and not even kidding, my dad's been joking about it. Well, not joking about it, but he's been saying he's a smoky for origin all season, which I disagree with. I don't think he's too close to the picture, but if you actually look at the list, he's probably like third or fourth 5.8 um, to choose from for New South Wales, so he's not that far off it. Um, but he is playing unbelievably right now. So to move him to centre, I just don't really get it. He hasn't played much centre at all in his life. Um, the only thing I was thinking is maybe um, we're playing the Knights. So I don't know which edge he's playing on, but maybe they fear Bradman best. We'll just run through our outside back. So they want a bigger body there. But I don't know if you risk the chemistry of your halves um, in that sense. Or potentially they want um, Jock Madden, who's been picked to make his debut off the bench, Maybe they want him to come on at about the halfway mark and they don't want Dewey to have to change position mid-game or something. Yeah, I'm trying to fathom it. I'm, as you can tell, I'm struggling. Uh, so Dewey to centre, M by to 5A. Little in for Simpkin, which I have to say I I probably agree with. I think Simpkin is an exciting prospect and we want to play the kids because we are struggling. But um, he did look a little bit underprepared, to be honest. I think maybe after we saw the impact Harry Grant had, we thought he would come in and do similar. But, uh, yeah, he doesn't look at that quality, um, which is very fair. Harry Grant's a one-in-a-generation player. But 
Um, he was bouncing off a lot of tackles on the weekend. David Fafita, hard, probably hardest man to tackle in, NR, in the NRL, but yeah, Simpkin couldn't lay a glove on him at times. And when Little came on, we looked a lot more stable. My issue is, uh, I'll be honest, both of them have had big raps for a while. And yes, Little's coming back from knee recos and stuff like that, but I don't think either of them have the attacking prowess that a hooker nowadays needs. If you look at some of the best hookers in the competition, uh, I think they're more just, you know, 2010 type hookers that just stand there, deliver good passes and tackle, which there is a place for them, but I think if you're going to be an upper echelon hooker, you need to be able to, you know, set up line breaks and stuff like that nowadays. Uh, Sean Bloor also came back from injury. That's exciting, albeit for Stefano Utoikamanu, who got put to the bench. Uh, to the reserve, sorry, which is very interesting in my opinion. Uh, he started the season really well, got ma- made the starting lineup, and in the last three weeks he's gone from starting to bench to bench with 20 minutes to dropped. So they're obviously not happy with his work. I think his defence has been pretty poor, um, but his attack's been good. And then Zach Sini got dropped for Tommy Talao, which I think is harsh, but they're both in a similar position in their career, Sini and Talao haven't really made an impact with their chances. So I guess either way, it's just um, a toss of a coin, really. But it does suck for Zach Sini, and I'm worried that he will go es- elsewhere and start killing it. But need to see a bit more of Tommy Talao. Um, he's not been great so far in his time in the NRL, and he had such huge expectations coming into the setup. So hoping for a bit out of him. But other big stories coming out of the team announcements. Uh, Kyle Flanagan got dropped. Uh, which you probably would have guessed after he got hooked, but that's a big, big uh, piece of news, really, after he was a big off-season signing for them. I do feel a bit bad for Flanagan. I think he has had a stiff career to start. He was really good at the Sharks, got offloaded on um, to the Roosters, uh, and then he was thrown into the deep end, playing in one of the best teams in the competition. Did decently, and now he's been thrown to the other extent where he's at one of the worst teams we've seen in the competition for a while and he's obviously really struggling. So they've brought in Brandon Wakeham at the six and they've moved Avrilo to seven. So we'll see how that goes. Hodgson's also been named to return from injury, but he's coming through the bench, which he said he's fine with. I think that's not a bad play. Uh, it'll be interesting to see the impact he has off the bench. Uh, Pappenhausen's in the reserves. Uh, not sure if he'll play, but we'll see. And then with Munster... Brandon Smith and Harry Grant out. Kenny Bromwich has been put, picked at hooker, which is interesting. And Riley Jacks makes his return from the wilderness to play 5-8. So um, an underman storm, but we'll talk about their chances for this weekend in a little bit. All right, moving into the predicted top eight section, as we always do. Had a few changes this week, actually. The six to eight positions really... They basically change every week as we as results change seem to change our opinions of some of the big teams. Well, not necessarily the big teams, but the middling teams. Uh, so I'm rolling with the same top five. I've got Storm at one, Panthers at two, Eels at three, Rabbitohs at four, Roosters at five. I think oh, I wouldn't. I'm not confident on the order, but they're definitely the top five. You'd have to say, and they're probably the only people who could win the premiership. Not even sure if the Eels, Rabbitohs, and Roosters can, but. Uh, They could all be in the prelim for sure. Um, But then 6th to 8th, interesting. Last week I had the Raiders 6th, the Titans 7th, and the Seagulls 8th. I've kept the same teams, but I've rearranged them. Uh, I've got the Seagulls now up to 6th. I just think if Tommy stays fit, um, yes, they might struggle through Origin without DC, Jake, and Tom. Fair enough. But that's only two games where they're forced not to play. They might not play the weeks after Origin, but... Um, so that might change my opinion if they miss those games. But at the moment, I'm just thinking if Tommy's fit the whole year, they sustain no big injuries. I think they're the sixth best team in the competition. The Raiders, I still think, would be a really dangerous team to come up against in finals. But I've got them at seventh now. Um, I've been pretty staunch with the Raiders. I don't lose faith in them quickly. But um, not necessarily that I think they're a bad team. But the more losses they have you know, brings their ceiling down in terms of wins, losses for the year. So I've got them down to seventh now, and I've got the Titans in eight. was very close to picking the Warriors, but I'm just not sure how their move back to New Zealand is going to affect them. 
Uh, I know we always talk about how teams traveling to New Zealand is really tough, but people don't look at, they have to travel to Australia every second week. So um, I'm not sure if that actually helps them or whatever. So I'm just leaving them out of it right now. I think the Dragons have not been impressive of late. Uh, the Broncos and Cowboys are impressive, and but I have to see a bit more from both of them. Tigers, no. Bulldogs, no. Sharks look rubbish, and I think that's it. Sorry if I've missed your team. Uh, so that's my new top eight. All right, moving into my origin team. Look, you could go really controversial with this, but I've tried to be realistic. Um... Uh, there's been a lot of talk about Tommy Turbo at fullback, but I'll be honest, they're picking Teddy at fullback. He's the captain. Uh, he's going to be there, so I don't think there's too much point speculating Tommy at fullback, but I get why people are saying it because he's playing incredibly right now. The only... I would consider it, but A, Teddy's captain, so he's got to be there, and B, Teddy can't play any other position while that we've seen, where we know Tommy Turbo is very good in the outside backs, and he can do... His sort of similar stuff from the outside back position where he just pops up at first receiver, steams in. So I don't see why he can't have a similar impact to get the game from centres. So I've got Teddy fullback, I've got Tommy Turbo in the centres, and that means I've got Pappenhausen on the bench as a 14, I think. I could just picture his pace coming off the bench. I know Queensland have tried it a couple times and not necessarily had big impact. I think we also tried it maybe with Cody Walker one game and he didn't have much impact, but I think Pappenhausen, injecting him into a game would be pretty scary. Maybe, I don't know what you do because I don't know if Pappenhausen can defend in the middle. Maybe, oh, I actually don't know. Maybe you swing him back, put Teddy into the line for defence. I don't know. They can tackle that issue. They get paid a lot more than me. Um, so that's where the fullbacks are. I've got Ado Carr on the wing and Toto on the wing. I know Daniel Tupo has been decent for New South Wales over his career, but I just think Toto's form has been irresistible, pretty much averaging 100 post-contact metres a game, which is freakish. People are lucky to average 100 a game. He's averaging over 100 post-contact, so I think he's picked himself. I know he's small. I know they're probably scared about kicking it to, like, like Coates kicking it, uh, kicking it to Coates on his wing or something like that, but... I just think maybe you put Tommy Turbo on his edge. Turbo can take the high balls, and Toto is going to give you a great base um, for the sets running out of his own line. Next to Tommy, well, not next to Tommy Turbo, but at the other centre position, I'm going Latrell Mitchell. I know Gutherson played there last year, and who was the other centre? Maybe Jack Whiten? I actually don't know. But I'm actually going Latrell Mitchell here. He's got centre experience. Jack White and Gutherson, not so much. Um, White and played a bit of centre, I believe, to start his career, if I'm not mistaken. I might be getting confused. But, um, yeah, I just think Latrell was in great form to start the year. Uh, he's, when he was playing special centre, he was probably the best in the competition. So I would probably have Lomax there, but he's injured till round 14. So he's out of my calculation. So I've got Latrell in at four, despite his lack of football over the last month. In the halves, this is the big one. I've got Jerome Lua and Nathan Cleary. I just think, I don't care about, well, I do care about it, but I just think there's a, when they're playing at a certain level, you've got to overlook how experienced they are. Otherwise, they're never going to get experience, if you know what I mean. And I'm not saying this is the year where we settle for a loss, but I genuinely think Jerome Lua deserves to play. Uh, I don't think Jack Whiten has... Um, slammed the door down. Yes, he won the Dallium last year, but I don't think he was the best player in the competition. And I don't think he slammed the door down in the opening nine rounds this year. And Cody Walker, yeah, no, he's just not reliable enough for me. And I think Jerome Luai is the best option here. And I think he should be the number six for New South Wales alongside his club teammate, Nathan Cleary. Uh, moving into the forward line, I've got my starting front rowers of Payne Haas and David Clemmer. I'm not sure if Clemmer played last year, but I just think he's really always been good for New South Wales, had a really strong start to the year for the Knights. Uh, and then in hooker, obviously, got Damian Cook. Uh, in the back rows, I've got Angus Crichton and Tyson Frizzell. They're probably the two most locked positions on the field. Number 13, I would have had Cam Murray, but I think he's ruled out to around 13, and I wouldn't want to pick someone who has had injury issues in the last month. So I'm going Isaiah Yo there. 
Uh, Nathan Brown hasn't really kicked the house down. And who's the other? Oh, Dale Finucane has only just come back from injury, so I'm going as a yo. He's got a good combination as well with the other Panthers boys. Papanhausen in at 14. I'm picking Tavita Pangai at the, on the bench. I just think he could add a real explosive aggressiveness off the bench to New South Wales that they've sometimes lacked up the middle. I think he would do a really good job there. I've got Daniel Saifidi and I've got Junior Paulo. So three really big boys. Uh, two boys who played last year in Saifidi and Paulo and Pangai. I just think they would be a really explosive bench along with Pappenhausen. That does mean I've left Jake Trebojevic out of it. I know he's starting to hit his straps recently, but um, yeah, I just think there's better locks in the competition right now, to be honest. White and Gutherson miss out. Yeah, I, I acknowledge it's very, very harsh. Um, in pretty much every other era, players of that quality have found a way into the team, but look, I don't want to take move positions too much, and I don't want to force players out of their natural spots. And uh, for that reason, I'm just leaving them out, sorry, to Whiten and Gutherson. Stephen Crichton just misses out just because I think Tommy Turbo has to play. Uh, Regan Campbell-Gillard was another option I considered. Paul Vaughan as well. Um, and then Low Max and Murray are the injuries that probably would have been there if full fit, but will miss out with injury, in my opinion. Uh, so stay tuned for my Queensland team next week. Let me know what you think of that New South Wales team in the comments. Uh, and I'd like to hear your thoughts. I know mine are pretty differing to some people. Um, and that moves us into Magic Round Preview. Very excited for the round. Have flirted with the idea of going up for the weekend, but sadly with work commitments, I can't really do that. But we'll do, we'll do it one year for sure. Um, my sure bet of the week, is, it actually looks like a good round. Uh, I can't lie. I think my eight tips are the eight favourites, but uh, that's just the way NRL tipping is kind of this year. And I'm not tipping well, so that's probably not the greatest tactic from me. Uh, Storm to beat the Dragons is my sure bet of the week. Storm do have a lot of outs. I am aware of that. I also made this tip before I saw that. However, I just don't think the Dragons are playing well right now. They started the season really hot. They pulled the Eels' pants down, but I think they're a different side now. And I think the Storm are too good. And I, I'm just more confident in them than any of the other games. I know Panthers have the Titans... But I think the tight, the Panthers are the have the they're the heaviest favorite of the week. But um, I'm not saying they're going to lose, and I'm 100% tipping the Panthers. But I think the Titans have more of an ability to upset a top team than the Dragons do. And hopefully Papenhausen comes back as well. That would also shore up my opinion. Uh, that is the second game on the Sunday, and the Storm and Panga dollar 15. Upsets of the week, as I mentioned earlier, I don't think I'm going to tip these guys. Not sure yet. However, I think the most likely upset is one of two. I've got the Warriors to beat the Eels. The Eels did not impress me on Friday night against a good Roosters team. I just think even though they scored 32 points, I think it ended up being they didn't impress me in attack and the Roosters didn't throw too much at them, which was a big reason why they came out winners. I think the Warriors are in really, really good form right now. Um, they've pushed Manly uh, really, really deep. Uh, I can't remember their previous results. I know they scored 20 points against a Storm team that looks impossible to score against. And the Eels have had their COVID issues. They've also had suspension issues. Uh, so I think the Warriors could upset the Eels there, and they're paying $3.10, which I think is good value. Another one I like is Brisbane to beat Manly. I've talked Manly up all episode. However, I think Brisbane are looking really good right now. And on their home deck, um, if Turbo has an off game, we're not really... Well, we know how bad they are without Turbo. We're not sure how bad they are with a Turbo that's playing a 6 out of 10 instead of a 10 out of 10. Um, I think Brisbane could upset them here if Manly don't play like they have the last month. Um, the Tigers showed that Manly aren't invincible. That first 30 minutes against the Tigers, they didn't look any good. Uh, Brisbane are paying $3.10. It would be a big upset, but I think it could happen for sure. Um, and the game spreads I do like. Brisbane at plus 8.5 at the line, um, that that extra 8-point buffer is pretty handy. Um, the Warriors, similar, plus 7.5, I like that, and it gives you an extra try, boost. And then I'm going, didn't like too many of the others, but I'm going the Knights. Uh, the line is 5.5, and, and they're obviously the favourites against the Tigers. But I, 
I've said this before and I'll say it again. If you have a tip and your tip, the line is less than a try, I think it's worth chucking it in the handicap because there's not too many games, unless it's a real flip of a coin, which I don't think the Knights and Tigers is. Um, hopefully they prove me wrong, the Tigers, but I'm confident the Knights will win. And I think them to beat the Tigers by more than a try is pretty likely. So running through my tips just quickly, I've got the Knights to beat the Tigers, Manly to beat the Broncos, Raiders to win, not sure who against, Rabbitohs to win, Roosters to win, Eels to win, Storm to win, Panthers to win. So basically just saying the top eight will win. So no real big calls for me there. I am tempted to back in my Warriors tip, probably more than my Brisbane tip, but we'll see. And it might depend on where my ladder position in tipping is this week because, <laughs> you know, that's kind of how tipping works, even though it shouldn't be. Um, so thanks for tuning in once again. I'm really, really going to try to put up more clips because I think the clips um, would be very interesting viewing. I know some people aren't down to sit through the whole 40 minutes, so I'm going to try and start cutting it up more, putting up more of them to Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And hopefully you'll see my face around again pretty soon. Uh, thanks for joining me. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy Magic Round. Go the Tigers. And, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Cheers. Bye.